Well, before we begin, I would just, I want to say, I don't often get the chance to sit in here and listen to the band play. Aren't they phenomenal? Can we give them another round? We are so blessed to have so many talented musicians who come and lead us in worship and give us the opportunity to celebrate our God. Well, this morning we are continuing, or concluding, I suppose, our sermon series on great big God questions. It's those questions that perhaps you've wrestled through in your life. You've struggled with, how do I answer this question? I know there's a good answer out there somewhere. I just don't know it. And so we've tried to provide those answers to you, give you an opportunity to learn about those things. And so I hope through this series, you found yourself more prepared to give a defense for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus, as St. Peter tells us in his first letter. And so this morning, we're going to conclude this series with one more question. The, the question that we have before us today is, where is God in suffering? Now, before we dive into the sermon itself, I want to take a moment to just give you a, a little bit of a warning, because this is going to be a challenging sermon but in particular, this will be a challenging sermon for you if you are going through suffering of your own right now, or if there's that big moment in your life that still fills you with heartache and pain. As we talk about suffering, it might be a challenge. And so before we dive in, I want to let you know where we're going to end this sermon, what the, where, the conclusion we're going to come to, in case you get lost in the, along the way, in the case I say something that focuses you in on your own life, that's not necessarily inappropriate. But I don't want you to miss the ending. Because the ending is the promise of God. And that promise is that he loves you. Whatever you're going through, whatever is going on in your life or has gone on or will happen, God loves you. And he has an answer for your suffering. And that answer is found in Jesus. Jesus brings about the promise and the hope of the resurrection. So that's God's gift to you. And that's his promise to you in your suffering. And we'll come to that promise. But in order to understand this question well enough, where is God in suffering? We have to get things in the right order. We have to understand the right order. Because I think a lot of times this question is extra challenging because we don't have them in the right order. We confuse the equation. It's kind of like one of those math problems. Have you seen math problems like these before, on, perhaps on Facebook or something? All right, are you, are you doing this problem in your head right now? Who got the answer one? Anyone get one? Anyone get four? How about 16? Anyone get 16? So across this room, we've come up with all sorts of answers to one problem. Why did we get all of those different answers? Well, it's because it comes down to the order of operations, take you back to your math class. You have to do this thing first, and then that thing, and then that thing. And if you do it wrong, well, then you're going to get the wrong answer. The same is true when it comes to asking this question, where is God in suffering? If we get it mixed up, if we start in the wrong place, if we get the wrong order of operations, we're going to come to the wrong conclusion. And the best example of this is oftentimes how people struggle and wrestle with this question. They look at their own lives and they say, I am suffering. Is that true? Is that a true statement? We endure suffering. That's an undeniable fact of our world. I am suffering. So then we ask questions about God. God is love. Is that a true statement? Yes. Good. And God is all powerful, right? Is that another true statement? So then God can end suffering anytime he wants to. Why doesn't he? And all of a sudden, you people find themselves questioning one of those statements. Maybe God doesn't actually love me. Maybe God isn't all powerful. And people will doubt one or two or both of those things and say, I don't know if God is worthy of being followed or being trusted because I don't know if he's all powerful. I don't know if he loves me and therefore I don't think he is worthy of my praise. Because the suffering I'm enduring, God has not brought that to an end. People have walked away from that. 
People have walked away from God saying, because of my suffering, I cannot believe in you. I cannot trust in you. But you're here today. I hope because you believe that God does in fact love you and that he is in fact all powerful, or at least you want to believe that, or you're willing to be convinced that God does in fact love you and he is in fact all powerful. And so that leads us to the question, Where is God in my suffering? As I'm facing this heartache and pain and loss, where is God in the midst of that? To get to the answer to that question, to get our order of operations correct, we need to start with the idea of suffering itself. Where does suffering come from? What causes suffering? I heard some people say it, sin. Very good. Sin causes suffering. Sin has brought death into our world. And if you think about suffering, all suffering is some form of death. Whether it's an illness or disease that can lead to death or anything else that we might face. All sin, all suffering leads us to death. And so sin itself causes suffering. Sin causes death. But you have to remember that sin isn't some nebulous force of evil out there in the world. Sin is done by sinners. Sin is caused by sinners. I want you to think of sin not, not as a force out there in the world, but more of a crack in the windshield. Anyone ever got a crack in your windshield? What happens if you leave that crack alone? It spreads, right? It spreads throughout the windshield. You don't have to do anything. The integrity of the glass has been broken. And so that crack is a corruption that causes the whole windshield eventually to come apart. And this is what sin is in the world. Sin has cracked the windshield. We don't have to do anything else because that suffering from that sin spreads. But, well, we sure find ways to crack that windshield on our own, don't we? We, in our own sin, also continue to add cracks to that windshield. We continue to corrupt this world and to cause suffering by our actions, by what we do. We continue to cause more problems. Sin causes suffering. So if you're looking for someone to blame for the suffering that you face, the suffering of this world, look no further than the sinner. If you're looking for a sinner to blame, look at your own heart. Look at the things that you have done and recognize that you are at fault for the sin and the suffering that is in the world. And because you are a sinner, because you have done this and you have caused suffering, you have also earned suffering. Suffering is both a punishment and a consequence for sin. If you think about it, imagine a kid who in a a fit takes one of their toys and smashes it, right? Well, as a parent, there's a very easy punishment for that sin, right? Well, your toy's broken. I don't have to add any sort of punishment to you. The consequence of your actions, the broken toy, is also the punishment for your actions. That toy is broken. The same is true of suffering. Suffering is both a consequence and a punishment for our sin. You have earned it. You deserve the suffering that you face. If we're looking at equations, if we're looking at how suffering fits into our world... We can say that we are sinners. And as sinners, we have caused suffering, and therefore we have earned suffering. That's a complete equation, isn't it? You don't have to include God in that equation at all to understand why you are facing suffering. Because you have earned it. Because you deserve it. But God has inserted himself Into that equation. God loves you. And he does not desire that you remain in your suffering. And so he has come in with his love to rescue and redeem you from your suffering. That's what we believe. We believe that God loves us. Remember those two truths? God loves us and he is all powerful. It is important that he loves us. Because without his love, if he were just all-powerful, there's a very simple solution to the problem of suffering. 
Just remove that which causes suffering. You and I. If God didn't love us, he could resolve suffering in an instant by removing us from the equation. Think about that that image of the kid who broke their toy, right? That would be another example of how do we resolve suffering? How do we resolve this brokenness? Well, take the kid out of the equation. No kid, no broken toy, right? But that doesn't make sense. The toy doesn't make sense without having the kid. And God says his world, his creation, doesn't make sense without you. And because he loves you, he has sought a solution that is about rescuing you from sin and suffering. And that's what St. Paul talks about. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What is God's answer to suffering? It's that he suffered for us. Jesus chose to die on the cross, to suffer For your sake, so that you might be rescued, that you might be redeemed. This is God's promise to you that He loves you, and He was not going to let anything stand in the way of rescuing you from your sin. And so Jesus came, and He chose the cross, He chose suffering and death, so that He could give you life. As church geeks, we like to call this substitutionary atonement. Big words there. But to break that down for you, atonement is paying for something that you have done done wrong. When you do something wrong, you owe a debt. You need to make it right. You need to atone for what you have done. And so this atonement is paying for what you have done. But this is substitutionary atonement. The word substitute is in there. That means Jesus has substituted himself as the payer. He is the one who will pay for your sins. He is the one who will pay. He will suffer. So that you don't have to. So that you can be rescued and redeemed. So that you do no, not any longer owe a debt for your sin. That you don't owe any suffering or death for your sin. That's his promise to you. Is that he has paid the price. And more than that, he has just paid the price. But he also offers you the life that he desires for you. A life of freedom from sin and death and suffering. And that life is found in the resurrection. The resurrection is a promise that God is going to free you from the suffering that you endure. He is going to give you a new life in Christ. That's the promise for you. That's the good news in the midst of our suffering. As we are dealing with the problems of this world, we know that God has promised in his love that he has paid the price. And what you get instead is the righteousness of Christ. So on the last day, when you stand in judgment, God will look at you and see Jesus. And he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the promise of God to you. That he has borne your suffering. But what do we do in the meantime? What do we do as we live in a world that is still filled with suffering and loss? Because we have this promise. We know the hope that is to come. But what about right now? What we can see is the amazing work of God in our suffering. God has this awesome way of taking evil, taking the suffering that we face and making something good come out of it. And there's no better example than the cross itself. Think about the cross. Was that an act of evil? Yes. It's the greatest act of evil ever because it is the murder of God himself. Sinners in rebellion against God murdered him. And every year, we commemorate this great act of evil by calling it Good Friday. We call it good because the greatest 
act of evil has brought about the greatest good work of God. Your redemption in Jesus. God takes suffering and turns it into something good. And this isn't just about the cross. God does this all the time. Read through scripture. You'll see an evil act turned to good. Think about Joseph with his brothers. They sold him into slavery. And then in slavery, he's accused of a crime he didn't do and thrown into jail. All so that God could rescue Joseph and his family from famine. In a confrontation with his brothers, Joseph tells them, Do not worry. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. God took the evil that was done to Joseph and used that to bring about redemption and good for Joseph, for his family, and for the whole world. The same is true of the Christians who who followed Jesus and were witnesses to him. They, like Christ, were cruelly treated. They were murdered in the most inhumane and vicious ways. Crucified, thrown to lions, lit on fire. Everything horrible you can imagine was done to the Christians of the early church. And yet one of the church fathers, a man named Tertullian, said, The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It seemed that every time a Christian was murdered, gospel spread like wildfire. And God was using these great acts of evil, the suffering of his saints, in order to spread the word so that more people might come to know who he is. I heard a quote recently that summarized this idea so very well. It says, God doesn't waste suffering. God doesn't waste suffering. This isn't to say that the suffering you face is not evil. There is so much evil in the world and it seeks to destroy you. But God, in his miraculous nature, takes that evil, makes something good come out of it. He doesn't waste the suffering that you endure, but he makes good come of it. And this is another thing that St. Paul says in Romans chapter 5. He says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is such a perspective shift on suffering. Because I don't know about you, I very much struggle to rejoice in my suffering. But what Paul is telling us is he's saying God is going to make good come out of suffering. Because there's three different perspectives on why suffering exists in the world. What causes suffering? First of all, we talked about the idea that it's a punishment for our sins. Suffering is the punishment we deserve. But also the punishment taken by Christ. Suffering is a consequence of our sins. It's the natural fact that we live in a world that is broken, and so we are continue to suffer until God brings about the restoration. The other reason for suffering is the suffering that is chosen. The suffering that is chosen for the sake of someone else. That's what the cross is. It is a, the suffering that Jesus chose for your sake. But now that we have been redeemed, we also have the opportunity to choose to suffer for the sake of other people. This was the life of St. Paul. This is what he did. He chose to suffer time and time again to bring about the gospel, to share the good news with those who needed to hear it. And at another place in his epistles, St. Paul lists out all the suffering that he has endured. He talks about being stoned, being beaten. Having 40 lashes minus one, being shipwrecked, abandoned, cold, and hungry. And all of this he did for the sake of the gospel. It was suffering that he chose. Because in that suffering, he rejoiced. Because that suffering produced endurance. Endurance that produced character. And character that produced 
hope in the resurrection. First for himself, that he grew in his relationship with God through all of his suffering. But more than that, it produced hope in others. That through his suffering, other people saw Jesus. Other people heard the promises of God and came to trust in him. God was working through his suffering to bring about the promise of hope. Where is God in our suffering? He's with us. He is suffering with us. He has suffered for us. And in that suffering, we can find the hope of the resurrection. Because in that suffering, we are always drawn more and more into a relationship with a God who chose suffering so that we might have life. So as you face suffering, as you face heartache and loss, I want you to see this not as the absence of God, that God doesn't love you, that he can't resolve your suffering. But instead, I want you to see the presence of God. That just as you are suffering, he chose that. So that he might rescue you out of suffering. So that he might give you a life that is freed from suffering. And for now, he has called you to suffer a little bit more. To endure that pain and heartache. So that you can be a witness to the hope of the resurrection that we have in Jesus. In his name, amen. Now may the grace of God, which transcends all of our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus always. Amen.